The news the department staff gave the board was bleak. They showed projections calculating the growth of prison population against the growth of the prison system. The charts say that within two years, Oklahoma prisons will be nearly a thousand beds short. By 1985, over 2,000 short. The immediate picture is just as depressing. The new room gained from limited double selling is gone. 41 counties are holding prisoners for the state, some are sleeping on floors, and Oklahoma County is releasing as many as 13 prisoners a day to state custody. Then came the bad news. Attorney General Jan Eric Cartwright has refused to petition the federal court for additional temporary double selling, wanting to wait till the state can convince them to lift the restrictions permanently. The board was incensed by Cartwright's action. Well, this board, there's no doubt that this board is vested with the authority and uh, the power to set policy for the Department of Corrections, not the Attorney General's office. Right. It's also incredible to me as a lawyer that a lawyer would refuse to follow his client's request, even though uh, maybe he doesn't agree with it. To me, that is absolutely incredible. The board voted unanimously to ask the court to allow temporary system-wide double selling in cells that meet federal guidelines. They said if the attorney general won't file the petition, a staff council will. For the immediate problems, they said the only solution was to open all available space at state institutions, including gymnasiums and warehouses. They say it isn't a good solution, but it's the only one they have. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4, at the Corrections Department. More police arrested 23-year-old Timothy Earl Rist late Friday night. Rist was driving a car investigators say matched the suspect's car from the abduction and murder of Tammy Carter on February 6th. Police have been investigating Rist as a suspect for about a week since a blood-stained bed sheet was found inside an apartment he had just vacated. Lab reports indicate the blood on the sheet is the same type as the victim's. Two women and another male were arrested at the same time as material witnesses. Then, late this morning, police arrested another suspect, 20-year-old Michael Eugene Harmon. Both men are unemployed, and both men maintain their innocence. I'd like to say this is a big joke. I don't know who's talking or doing this about this, but it's a setup. That's all I wish to say. That's my true feelings. Are you been advising your eyes, Mike? Yes, I have. I was free to speak. That's all I wish to say. Police are looking for a third suspect, who they believe has left the state. Police say all three men were living in the apartment, and they have evidence to connect them with the crime. There's other farm evidence, but it's something I can't discuss at this time. Investigators say they have not ruled out any relation between these suspects and the unsolved murder of Tracy Diane Nielsen, who was killed in Moore in January of 1981. But so far, they have found no such connection. First-degree murder charges should be filed against Rist and Harmon on Monday. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4, in more. About 20 angry Midwest City residents gathered tonight in the home of City Councilwoman Dorothy Jo Zachary. Most are from Ward 4, which is the area Councilman Paul Farrago represents. The last two days, they've received a letter from Mr. Farrago asking for money, not in the form of a campaign contribution, but for funds to help his own personal financial situation. Well, Action 4 has tried to call Mr. Farrago throughout this afternoon and evening, but he hasn't answered his phone. Likewise, the people are upset. They haven't been able to reach him and ask him about the letter. Uh, I have been trying to get him for eight months on the telephone, and he won't answer. I was shocked. I, I've read this letter 75 times, I'm sure, because I tried to get this man for so long, and he wouldn't answer my calls. He wouldn't come to the telephone. So I, he doesn't know me. So the people have taken their questions to Councilwoman Dorothy Jo Zachary. Zachary says she doesn't know if it's illegal for Farrago to solicit private funds, but that she certainly feels it's bad public relations for council members. And I am personally upset and concerned about it because 
I feel like that perhaps this is a reflection of the council as a whole that um, it would cause more confusion on our council. We checked with District Attorney Bob Macy this evening to see if the letter from Mr. Farrago is illegal in any way. Well, Macy says to his knowledge, as long as Mr. Farrago states why he needs the money and where the money's going, that it's not illegal. Carol Lambert, Action 4 in Midwest City. Patrick Henry Early has lived here in the southwest part of the state during the past year. But it seems a lot of people in the neighboring towns don't know Mr. Early or have only met him when they've gone to the Fort Cobb Marina to buy their fishing license. I don't personally know this gentleman, but I've met him uh, in February when I went out to the Fort Cobb Lake area to purchase a uh, fishing license uh, at the Fort Cobb Marina, the lake marina there on the lake. What was he like? He seemed to be a pretty nice gentleman to me. He never uh, was rude or got out of hand in any way. He uh, joked around a little bit uh, about the fishing weather. I asked him a couple of questions about where would be a nice location to fish out there on the lake, and he suggested a couple of places. This is the state fishing license that was issued to the police chief, and as you can see, it was signed by Patrick Early. Action 4 has learned that Early's live-in roommate, Rebecca Long, leased this marina on Cobb Creek Reservoir last September. But according to townspeople in the area, Early actually ran the place until he was arrested here last Monday. Carol Lambert, Action 4, the Cobb Creek Reservoir. Patrick Early's criminal career spanned four decades. He was suspected by authorities of committing crimes everywhere from Kansas to California. And during that time, he spent two years here in Duncan. Early was well known to Duncan law enforcement personnel. Before he moved to town in 1969, Early had already served time for murder and armed robbery convictions. He was arrested once in Duncan for assault with intent to kill. But the witnesses suddenly developed amnesia when it came time to testify. And though he couldn't prove it, Duncan Police Chief Dale Anderson was sure Early was mixed up with some other trouble. While Pat Early was living here in Duncan, uh, uh, which was in the late 60s, early 70s, he uh, uh, evidently had a visitor one night that came by and uh, shot the house up. Mr. Early wasn't in the house at the time, but it was believed to be somebody that uh, uh, was... Uh, character of some sort to come by and, uh, and do that, but we never determined exactly who it was. Former District Attorney Joe Humphrey was also aware of Pat Early's mobster reputation. Humphrey found out firsthand what type of person he was dealing with when he prosecuted Early's buddy Terry Womack on felony charges and sent him packing to the penitentiary. I ran into Terry and I was, he was shooting pool and I was just kidding with him and he asked me about how my horses were doing. I said, great, I got a young horse of just racing, you know, young paint stud them racing. And he asked me where it was, and like a dummy, I told him where it was. And, of course, the next morning, the, the horse was dead. The two of the guys that, that I understand were there are dead now, and Pat was the third one was there, according to my information. Early finally moved away in 1972 when he was convicted of bombing some Wichita grocery stores. When paroled from federal prison last year, Early moved to Fort Cobb Lake instead of returning to Duncan. Stevens County authorities were glad to find out Patrick Early had decided not to move back to their area. Scott Wallace, Action 4 in Duncan. The manager of the Rockwell apartment building had heard the men who lived in apartment 109 were planning to move out. When the two men disappeared for more than a day, he went into the apartment expecting to find it empty. Instead, he found it a shambles, and one of the men was dead, partially nude in the bathtub. 
The victim had only been living in the building a little over a week. Police don't have a firm ID on the man, but described him as a white male around 60. Neighbors say the victim and his roommate had been arguing the last time they were seen, late Wednesday afternoon. Shortly after, police say the victim must have died, and neighbors say the missing roommate disappeared. The door was locked from the outside, and the body was partially hidden with bedclothes. Investigators have not determined the exact cause of death, but say the circumstances warrant an investigation of homicide. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4. At about 6 o'clock this morning, 60-year-old Hazen Young opened up this Sinclair station at Southeast 59th and Sunny Lane. He apparently was using this ladder to change the gasoline prices for today. Well, sometime during the next two hours, the Oklahoma City man was found dead in a back room of the station. A customer told authorities he stopped by around 8.30 this morning to buy some gas, and when he couldn't find an attendant to pay, he walked inside and found Young lying on the floor. Preliminary investigation indicates he's probably been beaten to death, but we'll have to wait for the final results from the medical examiner's office to, uh, for that determination. Robbery is the apparent motive in the murder. Money is reported missing from the cash register and the victim. Authorities say they found a possible murder weapon, but have no suspects in custody. They are, however, questioning several people about today's killing. Carol Lambert, Action 4 in Southeast Oklahoma City. Unlike a year ago, there were no threats of protest at this year's Passion Play. Plenty of policemen were on hand, but their services were not needed. The faithful trudged the half-mile hike up Audience Hill carrying blankets and sleeping bags, anything to keep warm. They would need the thermal protection before the night was through. It is a bit cold, but it's, you know, it's not that bad. You think things will uh, warm up a little bit? Once yeah, yeah. Once things start happening here, I think it's going to be really exciting for everybody. Lots of good energy here. The service got started with a salute to Native Americans. Kiowa entertainer Ray Darby Hunting Horse led off with the Lord's Prayer in Indian Sign Language. Some people paid closer attention to the pageant than others as the cast and crew spun their three-and-a-half-hour chronicle of Christ's life. temperature dipped down into the lower 40s overnight. A brisk breeze made things feel even colder. The weather tested the patience of those who stayed, much like the biblical Job. Well, we thoroughly enjoyed it, except we like to froze to death. <laughs> but it's fabulous, fantastic. I saw the biggest part of it in various scenes. Uh, whenever they was on one particular scene for a while, I covered up because it's kind of cool. But it would have been all right if I had proper clothing to wear. The future of the Passion Play seems secure. Pageant organizers just recently signed a long-term lease with the federal government for use of the land. It looks like worshipers who wish to attend the sunrise service in the future will have the opportunity to do so. Scott Wallace, Action 4, on the Wichita Mountains Wildlife Refuge. Last Saturday night, Edmond police had the help of two teenagers being used as decoys. The plan was to have both teens, who are under 18 years old, attempt to buy beer at different convenience stores. Police wanted to make the rounds at all of Edmond's convenience stores. Some of the stores were chipped off in the middle of the investigation to be extra careful, but not before a dozen people had been arrested for selling beer to minors. Employees at the stores said it was business as usual. A clerk at one store told Action 4 that it is policy to ask for identification if someone looks too young to buy beer. 
and last Saturday was just a case of poor judgment at the wrong time. Normally we would ask for IDs. I don't know why they didn't that night. Probably he was busy and thought that she was old enough, and you know that was all there was to it. But we have had customers since this was on TV. We've had customers come in, and they thought it was funny because they've been in here when we would ask them for their IDs, and kids like was 25 years old, and we would ask them for their ID, you know, and they've been in here when that kids would come in and try to buy beer, and they wouldn't be old enough, and we'd tell them that they had to. Have I had two in here this morning. Edmond police say it really doesn't matter if a store normally asks for ID. What matters is, is ID checked when there's ever a question about a beer buyer's age? The point is they need to check everyone that there's the slightest suspicion uh, for an ID card. If they're under 19 now, under the law, don't sell to them. Check. Police say even though they know who tipped off some of the convenience stores, there is little chance those people will be prosecuted. The investigation is not over yet. Police would not go into detail as to what they are planning next, but Edmond convenience store clerks hope they are not included. Ed Stewart, Action 4 in Edmond. The Oklahoma City Council spent much of the morning deciding if a zoning change would make some city residents mad enough to go through with de-annexation. City leaders eventually decided to zone the land industrial that had been agricultural. Officials were concerned about the fact that a number of residents have indicated they would rather be a part of the town of Newcastle because they believe Newcastle can provide them with a better water system. One council member questions whether or not Newcastle can keep its promise. I feel like that there's been some misrepresentations made, and uh, before I would vote for de-annexation, I feel like I have an obligation to those people to make absolutely certain the promises that have been made to them are carried out with the city of Newcastle. And that's what, I, that's what I want to make certain is going to happen before I can support it. The area that could be de-annexed is in Scott's Ward 5. When Southwest Oklahoma City homeowners heard the 100 acres of farmland was going to be used for industrial purposes, that's when talk of joining Newcastle started. Many residents say the threat of big business on the other side of the highway worries them. Newcastle's town manager says he wrote a letter to Oklahoma City's city manager to talk about the de-annexation, but says he never received a response. And he told Action 4 that Newcastle can provide better water service at a better price than Oklahoma City for those in the area. We stated that I have certified letters went to every property owner, which states that yes, you will have water availability on the same policy provided by the city of Oklahoma City, which basically is if you're big enough to pay for it, we'll bring it to you. But you have to pay the cost. We did not go looking for them. They came to us. Even though the Oklahoma City Council decided to go ahead and change the zoning for this area, making it light industrial, the town manager for Newcastle doesn't think that'll make any difference to the residents of southwest Oklahoma City. He thinks those residents will still want to be a part of Newcastle because in his opinion, the pros still outweigh the cons. Ed Stewart, Action 4 in Southwest Oklahoma City. March 15th, a tornado hit Ada, Oklahoma killing one person, injuring over 30. April 2nd, a killer tornado ripped through Paris, Texas, taking the lives of eight people, injuring over 200. This is why some experts are predicting this year's tornado season to be bad. Experts here in Oklahoma disagree, not necessarily on the season's harshness, but the actual prediction. We have very little skill to predict more than just a couple of three days in advance. So we can speculate because of what's occurred thus far, we've had some severe tornado outbreaks that maybe those will continue for the rest of the spring and we will have a bad year. But our skill in extrapolating into the future is not very great. Only forecasters come close to predicting tornadoes and even then they're not predicting. They're simply saying that the conditions are right for severe weather. When such a warning is given, it's up to us to respond and take the necessary precautions. Sherry Sellers, Action 4 in Norman.
The biggest hazard for oil field workers is the driving of the rigs to and from the jobs. Typical falls are also a problem for employees of oil companies. This according to a technical specialist for Dow Chemical Company. What can be done to alleviate some of these dangers? Dr. Ralph Langer says training is the answer. We bring in our uh, potential drivers from around the United States, actually put them through a two-week training program to make sure that they know how to properly handle these trucks. Those who cannot demonstrate their ability to handle it just are not allowed to drive. We still, uh, they're good employees, they can do other operations, but we just don't allow them to drive these special rates. Dr. Langer says the accident rate in the oil industry isn't really that high. If you look at the record, the petroleum industry does not have that bad of a record. In fact, they're uh, uh, only a, a fourth or fifth in as far as all industries in this country. So, and as you indicated, you've had such a rapidly growing industry in the last decade so that it, as I say, it appears to be more accidents than there really are. Now that drilling in the state is slowing down, Dr. Langer says there will be more time for training and education of employees. This will benefit everyone in the industry. Ben McCain, Action 4, Oklahoma City. They call it disintermediation, and what it means is this. As the interest rates on government securities go up, people have an incentive to take their funds out of savings institutions, like SNLs, and put them into those higher-yielding government securities. Now the upshot of this is less money is left in the savings and loan associations, less money is left for people who want to borrow money to buy houses. Also, it makes it harder for the SNLs to pay their own bills. Now, why do government security rates go up? The answer is the federal budget deficit. When the federal government borrows a lot of money, that drives up interest rates. So the SNLs problems, the problems of people who want to buy homes, just two more reasons that the Reagan administration must trim its projected deficit. For Action 4 News, I'm Will Clark, and that's the bottom line. Signs of the recession are everywhere. We have nine million people out of work. We have the highest bankruptcy rate in 20 years. Yet behind those dark clouds, there is a silver lining. In fact, I look for the economy to turn around sometime this summer. Now the reason I feel that way is because this summer in July, the first of the 10% personal income tax cuts is going to take effect. Those tax cuts will put an extra $4 billion a month into the spending stream in the economy. Also this summer, Social Security payments are going to go up by 7.5%. That will add another $1 billion in spending and should shore up the economy. Also, I think interest rates are going to come down a little bit. By August or September, I look for mortgage rates to be in the neighborhood of 15%. That won't signal a dramatic recovery for the housing industry, but it should help. For Action 4 News, I'm Will Clark, and that's the bottom line. There were two issues facing Judge Luther Bohannon today. One, the main issue, was whether or not he was going to allow permanent double selling in the Oklahoma prison system. The second issue, a little more minor, was exactly who was going to represent the corrections board. Judge Bohannon settled the second question almost out of hand. Since corrections board attorneys decided to agree with the state attorney general's office stand on permanent double selling, he ruled that the attorney general could represent the corrections board. Almost as quickly, Bohannon ruled that double selling could be carried on indefinitely and at the discretion of corrections yeah, director it's Larry it's Meacham. It. Since the state is trying to commit themselves to a good correction system, and I'm part of that, then he has better confidence than he would if he thought that we were talking out of both sides of our mouth. But when ACLU attorney Lou Bullock walked out of the courtroom, he had a different interpretation of the judge's ruling. When I said this morning that this system is beginning to deteriorate, I meant it. We're headed back to the old days. 
And unless the legislature begins to recognize that, uh, they're going to see prisons blow up. They're going to see, uh, rather than their capacity expanded, they're going to see it, it uh, being destroyed. Today is not 1973. 1973, at Callister, we had from three to five people sleeping in the cell. We had people sleeping on the runs. We had limited or no recreation. We had people locked up for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We had uh, almost no program. But a man who was there, former Oklahoma convict Bobby Battles, whose lawsuit got the federal courts involved in Oklahoma prisons 10 years ago, says overcrowding could take us back to 1973. Prior experience, 1973, Double sailing was instrumental in causing the riot. And I feel that uh, at this particular time, double sailing is, is the key to another riot. And I don't think that uh, we should use human lives to correct mistakes that are being made constantly. Ted Brown, Action 4 at the Federal Courthouse. A grand time was had by all tonight by those who have given their spirit and dedication to make our Western heritage remembered. Many special guests were honored from several states, along with numerous film and TV stars. Celebrities such as Slim Pickens, Dennis Weaver, James Arness, Gene Autry, and other big Western names kept busy before the awards presentation, signing autographs for beloved admirers. Several categories were recognized tonight for outstanding achievement to the preservation of Western heritage. KTVY was a especially pleased to receive the award for the 1982 Western documentary film. Entitled Oklahoma Gems, the project made use of KTVY's extensive film library that dates back to the 1880s. The subjects covered included the Oklahoma Run, the first capital, the life of Will Rogers, along with other great Oklahomans who made the state what it is today. Accepting tonight's award for the documentary was writer and producer of the Oklahoma Gems series, Steve Newman. Uh, it's a fantastic honor. I, I'm really a little bit overwhelmed by it. When we started up on the gym in a series of research about eight months ago, I had no idea it would uh, end up with an evening like this. Schools across the state will receive videotapes of Oklahoma Gems as KTVY's gift to the Diamond Jubilee celebration. Carol Lambert, Action 4 at the Cowboy Hall of Fame. Bankers from across the state gathered at the Lincoln Plaza Inn. Their annual conference focused on ways to revive the agricultural industry. One of the ways the bankers were hoping to revive the depressed industry is by lowering interest rates. A newly formed agricultural credit corporation known as MABSCO is expected to do this. MABSCO is in the process of organizing itself into uh, Ag Credit Service Incorporated. This Ag Credit Service Incorporated will provide the ability for rural banks to rediscount and bring additional capital funds into the state of Oklahoma. Crawford is optimistic about the future of farming. I think the state of Oklahoma is blessed with diversity and the ability of banks and the ability of farmers to adapt to various environments. I feel like that uh, uh, we should see a turnaround within the next six months. Even if bankers do manage to lower interest rates, farmers will still have another major problem, and that's the low prices they're getting for their products. Ag experts say it may take a while to correct this problem. Ben McCain, Action 4, Oklahoma County. <laughs> 